this one on my hand now on slide number four. So our identity. Slide number five. Our identity as a human. I exist, but am I truly human? Now yesterday we gave you some ayat about insan, etc., where Allah Taala is describing some inherent aspects of humanity. And then I explained to you that the deen was revealed. For example, Sayyidina Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa said that this deen of Islam is a deen of fitra. Fitra means your inherent instinctual human nature. It means that Allah Ta'ala perfectly designed the deen of Islam for humanity and he perfectly designed humanity for the deen of Islam. So it's a perfect fit, like they say, like a glove. A hand fits the glove perfectly. So this deen is deen of fitra, and we are also a people of fitra. So deen of Islam has been perfectly designed for a human, not just for a believer. The entire deen, Quran, Sunnah, Sharia, Iman, Islam, Ahsan, historical understanding, awareness of social reality, remember? All of deen has been designed perfectly for each and every and any insan in any time, place, culture, society from the time of Sayyidina Rasulullah Sallallahu until the end of this world. And humanity has been designed perfectly as a perfect fit for that deen. So then that this is another meaning of peace that I explained to you the other day that Islam means salam through taslim. Islam means to create peace through submission. And you, you're at peace when you're joined in perfection. Like those people who say they have a peaceful marriage, so they say, oh, our match was made in heaven. Now the expression that means that Allah Ta'ala designed us perfectly for each other. Our young friend who recently got married, he's smiling. I won't take his name. SubhanAllah. Huh? Allah Akbar. Yes. So just like that, you're supposed to have a perfect marriage with deen. All right. The question is that even before a person adopts a belief, what are some aspects of humanity that we can check in ourselves? So these are two verses now I'm plucking out from yesterday's broader presentation. Slide number six. The first thing, our identity as a human is to be faqir. What does faqir mean? Allah Ta'ala said, going, Ya yuhan nas, antumul fuqara'u ilallah. That all oh, people, a nas people, in sound humanity. Ya ayyuhannas, O people, each and every single one of you are what? Fuqara. Each and every one of you is faqir ilallah. Faqir means you're muhtaj. You're absolutely, completely needy. You're in a state of utter need, desperate need, pure need. Faqir means dependent. You're entirely needy and dependent on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what does it mean? It would mean to be human is to need Allah. To be human, not to be a believer. Simply to be human. To be human is to need Allah. This is another way you can understand that secular humanism, if you ask me, and whatever little knowledge I have of history and historical religions, secular humanism is actually that ideology that is the most against Islam, even more against Islam than Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Christianity. Why? Because secular humans in a sense you don't need, it takes away your concept of humanity. It's not just against Islamic beliefs, aqidah, or Islamic practices, or Islamic law. It's against the essence of humanity because secular humanism, its most forceful philosophical concept is you don't need God. That's what secular, there's no need for God at all. Not in the state, not in society, not in the individual, not for morality. You don't need God at all. Allah Akbar Kabira. And Allah Ta'ala is saying in the Quran, what? Ya ayyuhan nas antumul fuqarao illallah. That, O oh people, each and every one of you absolutely, completely, utterly, irrevoc irrevocably, unceasingly needs Allah Ta'ala and is completely dependent upon Him. It's a totally different concept of humanity. This is so I think yesterday because we did, so sometimes you can see if I build the whole workshop, then you get lost in it. You can get lost. I don't think it was flushed out for you what I was trying to do yesterday. So today I just took two verses from the humanity workshop to tell you what does it mean to be a human. So to be human is to need Allah. 
that even as believers, like I was telling, this verse still applies to us. So one is, okay, I want to check how good is my taqwa. I can check how good is my sunnah. I can also check how good is my insaniyya, right? By checking this, do I feel in my heart a need for Allah Ta'ala? Have you ever seen a faqir? That's a person who is needy. So we explain in Urdu, unko to wo pura sarapai fakir hai. Unki aankh mein fakir hai. Unki chalne mein, bolne ki andaz mein fakir hai. It means in English that every single aspect of their being is exuding, projecting that need. The way they look at you, you will feel this is a needy person. The way they carry themselves, they're a needy person. The way they walk, they act, they interact, you can tell this is an extremely needy person. Your heart will tell you this person is truly needy. Are we like that with Allah Ta'ala? Do we always feel this need? Have we realized this aspect of our humanity? Or do we feel needy of other things? That I need money, I need fame, I need acclaim, I need praise. What are the things that we feel desperately needy of? Hmm? Now the beautiful thing about Iman is if a human being completely needs Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, by adopting Iman, they completely get Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's coming later. That's coming later. This is the perfect, the perfection of the match, the perfect correlation. By adopting Iman and Islam, they perfectly, completely, absolutely, entirely, they get Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To be human is to need Allah. And we need to increase that aspect of humanity in us. When you feel need for him, you won't miss Fajr. A lot of people say, oh, I'm not regular in Fajr. Can you please tell me what to do? There's nothing to do. You have to be more serious in your attitude. First, when Allah Ta'ala called it Fard, it means you have to view it as an obligation. It means your attitude has to be, this is something I absolutely must definitely do. Like if you have an 8 a.m. visa appointment, or you have a 7 a.m. exam, you, you treat it as a Fard. You make sure you reach there on time. That's how you're supposed to pray. That's it. That's what Allah says is fard. Second, you should means you don't have you don't feel the need then. You're saying if you sleep through fajr that I can get by my day without praying fajr. So that's not fakir. <laughs> that's not needy. <laughs> you say no. I need my chai. I need my breakfast. I need my tea. I need my morning newspaper. My day is not going to go by with that. You'll even find people like that. That they're running late and like okay, I can either arrive at work at nine a.m. and skip my tea. Or I'll drink my tea and arrive at 9.10. So you know what they decide? I need my tea. <laughs> yeah, I need my tea. I'm arriving at 9.10. <laughs> yeah, that's called need. <laughs> it's human nature. You will do what you need. When you need food, you will eat. Believe me, you feel the need for water, you will drink. So your actions, the greatest motivation for action is need. Allah Ta'ala is telling us, Antumul Fuqarao illallah. You need Allah Ta'ala. <laughs> You need it. So when you feel that need, you don't need any motivation, encouragement, inspiration, tips, techniques, strategies, the top 10 tips to wake up for Fajr. Allah? What, what do you think Fajr was? Is Fajr some like contest that you're competing in the Olympics that I need to give you strategies for that? That's your need. You, can you find an article like that, the top 10 techniques to make sure you eat food in 24 hours? You say, I don't need any tip, tips for that. I don't need techniques for that. That's my need. To eat is my need. Can you find top 10 techniques to make sure you drink water? Hmm? No, because that's a need. Nobody needs any help in a need. You understand? So we need Allah. To be human is to need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a lot of people who accept Islam and the history of conversion, which is the entire history of our deen, is the history of converts. All the Sahaba were converts. Right? It's because they felt that need, they accepted that need, they acknowledged that need. Acknowledge that need in their heart. Second aspect, slide number seven. Our identity as a human is Abd. Allah Ta'ala says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ Allah Ta'ala says, I have not created jinn, nor humanity, nor, nor people, nor mankind, nor people, إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ except so that they may worship and serve me. That's it. So to be human is to worship Allah. To be human. To be human is to be an abd. To be human is to be a slave of Allah. To be human is to submit to Allah. To be human is to 
be an abd to obey Allah. And to be human is to be an abd to worship Allah. Otherwise you're not human. It's the definition of humanity. Again, right again the same ayah. Secular humanism says no. You see the others, even Christianity, there's worship. Judaism, there's worship. Hinduism, there's worship. Buddhism, there's worship. Yes, that's a separate thing. That the, many of those worships aren't based on Tawheed. But at least this human aspect of worship is there. Right? Secular humanism, you don't need, there's no worship. There's no need for worship. There's no need for obedience. It's the most antithetical concept to our deen. It's against the Quranic concept of humanity. Alright? Now here, Layabudun comes from Ubudiyya. Ubudiyya does not mean only worship. Right? It doesn't mean that man was created to worship. Right? That's why I call it worshipful servitude. Man was created, humanity, people were created for servitude, subordination, submission, slavehood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's 24 hours. Like in this world, when in historical communities there was slavery, so the persons being a slave, that was their identity. Even when they were done with their work, and if their master told them, okay, I'm done, you can go. But it's his identity, it's who he is, he still feels like a slave. He doesn't say, no, when I'm 9 to 5, I feel like a slave, and 5 p.m. to 9 a.m., I feel like a free man. No, no. <laughs> he say 9 to 5, maybe that's when my master has given me the duties to perform as a slave. 5 p.m. to 9 a.m., I still feel like a slave. It's my identity, it's who I am. So this is a feeling. It's a feeling. It's an identity. To be the abd, an abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, for example, somebody says, I'm a surgeon. It doesn't mean they're always performing surgery. But this is who they are and this is what they do. So an abid it doesn't mean they're always performing ibadah. They're working in the world, engaging in the world, ideally doing some type of khidmah in the world also. It's not that the only engagement of the world is to earn it. <laughs> this is also a big misunderstanding. When you talk about balancing deen and dunya, you have to put the right dunya to balance the scale. And if you think dunya is just about earning, that type of dunya can never be balanced with deen. Dunya is about earning and serving. Earning and serving. That type of dunya, that can be balanced with deen. That type of person can be balanced. Always remember, you find a person that the relationship with dunya is only earning, there's no concept of balance now. There will always be imbalance in their life. Because their dunya is skewed. So you put a skewed thing on the scale, the scale can't be balanced. Alright? But that earning is also part of ubudiya, and that serving is also part of ubudiya. And then, of course, there's also worshipping going on. There's obviously worshipping going on. Alright? So, Ubudiya, so in Urdu it's called Maqam Abdiyat. Maqam in Arabic means that you reach a station. A station. That Abd becomes your inseparable sifat. Abd and Abid, both are included in this word. So, that slavehood is in your words and your statements, in your thoughts, in your desires, your wishes and in your feelings and emotions and in your actions. So these are five things. Four are there. Number one is your aqwal, words and statements. Second is your afkar, your thoughts. Third is your khashat, your desires and wishes. Fourth is your ahwal or kifiyat, your emotions and feelings. And fifth is your a'mal and af'al, your actions. Your actions are based on the first, your actions and words are based on those other three. Words and actions are based on what you think and want and feel. So if you're a slave to Allah in your thoughts, and if you've made your nafs a slave to Him, you only want and desire what He wants, and if you made your heart a slave to Him, then when your akal and your nafs and your kalb, all three are slaves to Allah then your words and your actions will be that of a slave. But some people, they don't ha adopt the full slavery, right? They don't, they're not an abd in their akal. Maybe they're a free thinker. Hmm? And there's a level of free thinking, free thinking within the bounds of slavery to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? But sometimes they're a little bit too free thinker. So their akal is not an abd to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imbalance. Then there will be some words and actions that they do that aren't 100% befitting a slave. Sometimes, okay, their akal, their mind is fully. They say, Sametna wa ta'na. Allah Ta'ala, my mind is yours. You fill it with Quran. You fill it with the nur of the sunnah of Nabi Kareem, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the knowledge of Quran, the knowledge of sunnah. My mind is yours. Okay, but their nafs is not completely a slave. 
Their nafs is not 100% slave to Allah Ta'ala. Nafs sometimes has its own, own wishes and desires, which are not what Allah Ta'ala wishes and desires for a person. So when the nafs is not 100% a slave, again there will be some statements and actions which are not befitting a slave. And third is qalb, that the heart and emotion, heart is not 100% a slave to Allah Ta'ala. What does it mean? Has some emotions and feelings that Allah Ta'ala is disobedient. For example, love for ghair mahram. Unlawful, romantic, lustful love for ghair mahram. So if that's in a person's heart, that means the heart is not 100% slave to Allah Ta'ala. So then there will be some statements and actions that do not befit this maqam of slavehood. Alright? So to be human is to be an um, To be human. It's part of humanity to need Allah Ta'ala to submit to Allah Ta'ala, abd is to submit, obey and worship. All of it is there, abd and abd. So this is the Qur'anic concept of humanity. And secular humanism accepts every other thing that I told you yesterday, like the akhlaq and good character towards parents, everything else we talked about, about humanity, right? Secularism accepts all of that, it takes these two things out. So otherwise in terms of character, good morals, good neighbor, all of that is the same. But what secular humanism took out was faqir abd abid from the definition of humanity. Ajin, <laughs> right? Very clever, very clever. Without involving somebody in some false worship of false deity, they just took it out altogether. So the other religions, ideologies were about wrong worship. There was worship, but it was being done in some incorrect way. Secularism just took out worship itself. <laughs> took out worship itself. The others were obeying wrong concepts. It took out obedience itself. Alright? So to be human is to be faqir. To be human is to be abd of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So next slide, slide number 8. This I explain to you. that How does a slave carry himself? Do they walk errantly? Do they have pride in their education degrees? No. So one aspect of this abd is humility. That to be human is to be humble before one's rabb, before one's malik, master, khalik, creator, lord and rabb. So that's why we have to check in ourselves. Lack of humility means lack of ubudiyya. It's not just an akhlaq, it's not just lack of character. It's lack in our slavehood to Allah Ta'ala if you feel a lack of humility in yourself. The more a person is a slave, the more humble they will be. Now, does a slave ask this, I'm still on slide number 8, does a slave ask this question from his master, is it farad or is it only sunnah? Hmm? Now, I'll give you another example. So there's a modern type of slavery. It's not exactly slavery, but it's something akin to it. It's called the corporate contract. Hmm? Now, I've told you this, those of you who have before, can you ever imagine a person working for a multinational company and saying to his boss, is it fart for me to do this? I just got an email that you want me to prepare this report for you to present when you go on the business trip to Singapore. It's not in my contract. It's not fard. <laughs> Let's call HR department and see, is it obligatory for me to do this? No, if you talk like that, you'll get fired, right? You'll get fired immediately. But technically you're correct. <laughs> okay, unless you try another way. If you say, okay, all I want is to make sure I don't get fired, right? It's like the believer says, all I want is I want to make sure I don't go to Jahannam. Is it fard or not? So if you write your boss that, that sir, if I don't write, prepare your report for you, will I get fired? <laughs> if you take that attitude, you'll get fired, <laughs> right? <laughs> huh? Why? Because now that's subordination. Slave is a super subordination called submission, right? This is a subordinate. I'm your underling, right? I'm your matat. So what does subordinate mean? What my superior, or taken in the military, what my commanding officer says, there's a chain of command, a line of command. I don't question the command. There's no, quest there's no option for me to disobey the command. So who has that right? What's the highest chain of command? Who is the real commander in chief? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <laughs> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's another chain of command. Hmm? So this, this is a question. All I have to tell you is in Quran. That's it. That's enough for the slave. My Allah Ta'ala wants me to do this? Yes. But the Mufti said it's nafil. He says, I don't care. I'm a slave. 
Oh, I love my, what my master wants me to do, I do it. But you say, but it's not far, it's nafal. He says, but I'm a slave. غلام کا کام ہی کیا ہے کہ مالک کے پسند کے مطابق بننا کے علاوہ what else does slavehood other than to try to make yourself more according to the wishes expressed by your master so I'm going to do fiqh for you later but spiritual approach yes it shouldn't matter to you if something is farad or sunnah muakadah sunnah ghair muakadah nafil it might matter if you have less time it might matter sometimes but in terms of your understanding it doesn't mean that fard is something that you do all the time. That part is correct. But and everything else is something I do none of the time. No, that's not like that. Right? Or another thing, that does, does the slave ask his master, what's the reason behind this? Is ki illat kya hai? Is ki hikmat kya hai? Is ki maslahat kya hai? So to translate from that or thing is, people ask it, what is the reason? What's the benefit? What's the wisdom? Hmm? A slave doesn't ask that of his master. Master says, go chop wood. Slave sees that there's plenty of firewood already. He doesn't speak. He goes and chops the wood. <laughs> he doesn't speak and say, Master, there's already firewood. He doesn't speak. He doesn't write back and say, Sir, you just gave that presentation here yesterday. It's just fine. No need to fix it up for Singapore. I'm busy. I've got other things to do. He doesn't talk back. He says, fine. Boss wants the presentation reworked. I do it. <laughs> That's it. This is called Samitna wa Ata'na. We hear, we obey, and there's no gap between hearing and obeying. We know and we practice, there's no gap. That's called being a slave. Alright? So like I told you, Islam means peace. Oh sorry, Salam means, it's not so clear here. Salam means peace. Taslim means submission. Islam means to create peace through submission. The name of our deen is that this ubudiyya, submission to Allah Ta'ala, is the only way to get peace. Alright? So this is what it means to be human. This is the Qur'anic concept of humanity. Radically different from secular humanism. Slide number nine. Then after that, after our identity as a human, comes our identity as a believer, our identity as a mu'min. So we are in sound number one, and now, present company, we are the ones who have chosen to adopt Iman. All right. So then the next question, so if you go back to slide number five, the question in slide five was, I exist, but am I truly human? In slide number six, I exist, but am I truly fakir? Slide seven, I exist, but am I truly abd and abid? Slide nine, I believe, but am I a believer? I'm alladhina amanu, but am I from the mu'mineen? Am I from the Mu'minun? So slide number 10. So first let's talk about this Iman. So that's our second identity. First our identity as a human. Now is the, our identity as a believer. Allah Ta'ala says, فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ That whomsoever wants, let them adopt Iman. And whomsoever wants, let them disbelieve in Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So what does it mean? We have been given the freedom by Allah Ta'ala to disbelieve in Him. And we've been given the freedom by Allah Ta'ala to disobey Him. And as far as the disobey one, me and you make that choice every day. And there's so many opportunities to make that choice. There's so many choices a person, a believer, in our capacity as an identity as a believer, is to, uh, in, our, in our capacity as a believer, we make so many choices whether to obey or disobey Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. All right? But I'm saying that Iman, and rather than Islam, it should say Iman. Iman is to voluntarily choose to believe and obey. So voluntarily choose to obey, I think you understood that. You have that choice. Lower your gaze or don't lower it. Pray Salah, don't pray it. Right? Be angry or control your anger. There's so many choices. Question arises now in the rational, theological, secularized, educational system did I really, was I really free to believe? Wasn't I just born in a Muslim family? Was so-and-so free to be, was Raj, who was born in a Hindu family, is he free to believe in Islam? Because he's born in a Hindu family. Isn't he just going to adopt the religion that his parents have, and didn't I just adopt the religion that my parents have? So question is raised on the first part of this freedom to believe. As far as freedom to obey, disobey, pretty much most people accept that, that yes, whether you're a believer or a disbeliever, you can. You have the freedom. You want to murder. You don't want to murder. 
you have opportunities in life. You have certain abilities to do evil, to do good, to obey, to disobey. All right? So let's look at this question now. And so this is going to go back to one of the first things we were doing. We spent more time in this than beginning the quote unquote intellectual approach, right? Looking at theology, looking at what people sometimes try to make arguments on the basis of reason against Islamic theology. So slide number 11. Free will and predestination. This is how the topic is framed in the Western philosophical literature. Free will and predestination. So what they're talking about, does to you, and actually even atheist philosophers still talk about this. It's not if this is nothing that secularism and atheism has decided. Even atheist Western philosophers have a whole range of views on this. If you're interested, from that whole spectrum of views, the one that is the closest to the Islamic understanding is what is called compatibilism. Compatibilism is a term used in Western philosophy, that which I'm about to show you again right now, that free will and predestination are compatible with each other. They're not actually a paradox. They're not mutually exclusive. All right? But that understanding of compatibilism is not in any way based on Quran, Sunnah, or Ilm al-Kalam, which I explained to you on the first day. Right? But to just to show you, interestingly, that sometimes people who are only using their reason or intellect or mind, they also arrive at the same conclusion that Islam has already identified earlier. In our deen, and in the tradition of Ilm al-Kalam, we, we arrive at the question differently. So this is a very important thing. When you're talking about a big question, the first is how did you arrive, how did you reach that question? And then how do you frame that question? So the early scholars of Kalam, and this starts right from the time of the Tabin, the earliest writing we have on this topic of free will and predestination is by Hassan al-Basri, Rehimullah Ta'ala. Hassan al-Basri was one of the greatest Tabin. You can say like he just missed Sayyidina Rasulullah just missed being a Sahabi. And he met so many Sahaba, so many Sahaba. He's considered one of the most, some people consider him the senior most Tabi. He met so very many Sahaba and he lived a long, fruitful life and he taught so many of the Tabai Tabin. He's not even from Basra, but when Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala anhu was Khalifa Amir al-Mu'mineen, so he wanted to send somebody to Basra. So he wrote a letter to the people of Basra, even though there were other Sahaba around at that time. He didn't pick a Sahabi, he picked Hassan, who was a Tabi. And he wrote a letter to the people of Basra that, O oh, Ahlul Basra, I am sending Hassan to you and you will take your deen from him. So Sayyidina Hassan, radiallahu ta'ala, went to Basra. And then he became known as Hassan al-Basri. Hmm? Now who in Basra took their deen from him? Even the Sahaba in Basra would take legal opinion fatwa from him. So we have in history, people talk about the Salaf Salihin. We talk about in the Khulafai Rashidun, Sayyidina Ali telling Ghair Faqi Sahaba to do taqlid of Faqi Tabi Hassan in Basra. Historical fact, indisputable. Oh, that's a touch of Islamic law for you. All right? So the earliest writing we have is Hassan al-Basri. So I mean, these were questions that the earliest Muslims were talking about. All right. How do, did the tradition of Ilm al-Kalam arrive at this question? So they arrived at this question by reflecting on the fact that Allah Ta'ala's za'at, which is his essence, his essential being, this is the existence of Allah Ta'ala as only he knows himself to be, Allah Ta'ala is pre-eternal. He has always been there. Then the second are his sifat, his attributes. And his attributes are also pre-eternal. So one of his attributes is that Allah Ta'ala's al-alim, that he is all-knowing, his sifat ilm. So Allah Ta'ala's absolute, complete, perfect knowledge of everything. So then the question was, that, okay, if Allah Ta'ala knows every single thing, well, amongst that everything, Allah Ta'ala knows what I'm going to do. Or Allah Ta'ala knows if I'm going to heaven. Or Allah Ta'ala knows if I'm going to hell. Right? So if Allah Ta'ala already knows whether I'm going to heaven or hell, right, let's take that ultimate thing, right? Then that means my fate is predetermined, right? My fate is predetermined. So it's the same question, but I wanted to show you how they arrived at it, right? As opposed to what most people think it was about Allah Ta'ala's sifat al-qudrat, that Allah Ta'ala is all-powerful, 
Therefore, all agency belongs to Allah Ta'ala. Therefore, I have no might and power. La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. And so I have no might or power to choose or act. That was a secondary way that it happened. But the original way the question was framed was more based on the ilm of Allah Ta'ala. All right? Okay. Move to slide number 12. So the first thing we're going to do here is that the question that is raised on this issue is that it's a suggestion that this is a paradox. Paradox means that it's an untenable contradiction. How can it be that I have freedom to believe and disbelieve, freedom to obey and disobey, and I will be judged on that and rewarded by Jannah or punished by Hellfire, when at the same time you're saying, Allah Ta'ala already knows whether I'm going to Jannah or Jahannam. Allah Ta'ala already knows whether I'm going to believe or disbelieve. Allah Ta'ala already knows every choice, every decision, every action I'm going to make. So it's put forth that this is a paradox. All right. So those of you who can see the board, uh, the screen, I'm going to separate this in two things. So what's going on here? One is called the knowing. Remember I told you that we framed the question that Allah Ta'ala's ilm and our amal. So does our amal have any real meaning when Allah Ta'ala already has ilm of our amal? Alright? Okay, so no, ilm means knowing and amal means doing and choosing. So in fancy terms I call it voluntary action and agency. Alright. Now, the real paradox would have been what? So there are three options here. There are only three options. That knowing and the doing would both be done by the human. Second option, that the knowing and doing are both done by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Third option, I guess strictly there are four options. Third option is that the knowing is with Allah and the doing part is with the human. Fourth option is the knowing with the human and the doing is done by Allah ta'ala. So there are only four possibilities. So if you use rationality, this is a problem that can only have four possible solutions. Right? So the question is, is there any solution that can solve the paradox? Is there any one of these four solutions that can solve the paradox? So what I'm going to do with you is process of elimination. I'm going to show you first that three of the four are definitely paradox. It means three of the four would be untenable, unlivable. You couldn't conceive life like that. You'll say it's impossible. So let's say number one, that Allah Ta'ala does the knowing and He does the doing. So he chooses and he does the actions for you. So all of you know your lived experience isn't that. Can I say Allah Ta'ala picked this watch up? I, can't. I picked the watch up, right? If Allah Ta'ala had the knowing and the doing, it's a paradox. If life is inconceivable like that. And like people say, then that would obviously be unjust. That if Allah Ta'ala did the doing, why should I be judged for those actions? When Allah Ta'ala was the actor. So that would be a second theological Paradox. So one is the worldly paradox that how can you conceive of life that Allah Ta'ala knows everything and Allah Ta'ala does everything also. Right? And theologically, if Allah Ta'ala himself did the actions, how can I be judged on the day of judgment for those actions when in, according to this framework, I'm not the doer, Allah Ta'ala is the doer. So that is out. That can't be a solution to the paradox. So that option is out. Okay? Second option was what? That the human does both? That the human has the knowing and the human does the doing. Now remember, what knowing you were talking about, we were talking about the future. Right? So, first of all, at a practical worldly level, nobody can say that, that I know whether I'm going to heaven or I'm knowing whether I'm going to hell. Nobody knows that. Nobody can say tomorrow I'm going to wake up for I'm not going to wake up. It actually doesn't match reality. It doesn't match your lived experience. Right? Theologically also, if the human being had the knowing, then you would be Al-Alim, not Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You would be the one who is Al-Alim. And you know theologically that's not the case. Another way I can tell you that it's unlivable, if you had the knowing, your akal would not be able to hand this, handle this knowledge if you knew everything about the future. The first knowledge that you wouldn't be able to handle is if you were to know when, where, how you're going to die. You wouldn't be able to handle that knowledge. Let's say I give you that knowledge. So I tell our friend Hamid, Right? So I tell Dr. Hamid that you're going to die at age 85 in Karachi. So what's he going to do? 
when he's 84 years old and 384 years and 364 days old, he's going to move to Lahore. <laughs> That's what he would do if he had this knowledge. <laughs> and I moved to Lahore, he says, I'm no longer in Karachi. He writes me, Dear Sheikh, I'm 85 and I'm happy in Lahore. Right? A paradox, right? If you say no, if you keep going, so Malakal Malt will come. Say, Allah, Hamid, Mojud, <laughs> Right? The angel of death will come and say, Allah, Allah, Hamid's not here. <laughs> hmm? so that's not possible. Theological paradox, that's not possible. That's not possible. You wouldn't be able to handle that knowledge. If I gave you the knowledge right now of everybody who would ever hurt you in your life, you would be crippled with depression for the rest of your life. You don't know how many knowledges that a human being is not able to handle. In fact, many human beings aren't even able to handle still the knowledge of their own past. That's called depression. Depression is that person who can't handle the knowledge of their present and their past. So imagine if I was to put on that person the knowledge of their future. No way. <laughs> so that would also be a paradox in terms of empirical, lived reality, lived experience, and in theology. So that answer is also out. That answer. These are the two paradoxes. So yes, if Dean claimed any of these two things, you could say this is a paradox. But Islam doesn't say that. Islam doesn't say any of these two things. Third option was what? Third option is that the human being has the know. So we split it up, right? The first two was both with Allah Ta'ala, knowing and doing. Second was both with the human being, knowing and doing. Third option is let's split them up. So we split it up with that the human has the knowing and Allah Ta'ala does the doing. Human has the knowing and Allah Ta'ala does the doing. So I mean, the human knows everything that's going to happen in the future about them and generally. And Allah Ta'ala is going to do all those things. Again, you know, in worldly, this is not your, this is not your experience. This is not how you've lived your life up till now, right? That you were knowing and Allah Ta'ala was doing everything, right? So it's against lived experience. So again, it's a paradox. And it's also against theological belief because if you have the knowing and Allah Ta'ala is do, doing the doing, so again, if Allah Ta'ala is doing the actions, why should I be rewarded and punished for the actions in the Day of Judgment? Allah Ta'ala did them, right? Yes, fine. I knew Allah Ta'ala was going to do them. I had the knowing. But I just knew it. Allah Ta'ala did it. Right? Now it's about, I mean, you know, please understand if you just walked in right now. Uh, latecomers, you will be very person right now. Right? So you'll have to listen. There's a reason I'm talking like this. I'm hypothetically, I'm talking in absolute hypothetical terms. All right? So this third option would also be a paradox. So all three, three out of four are definitely paradox. So even Ras now will tell you the fourth one must not be a paradox. And uh, interestingly enough, the fourth one is what Deen of Islam says, which is what? They're split and Allah Ta'ala has the knowing and the human being does the doing. <laughs> Allah Ta'ala has the knowing and the human being does the doing. All right, round number two. Round number two is that a person says this is also a paradox. A person says, although strictly according to logic, if there are four solutions, one must be, is, is, one must be an escape to paradox. So by process of elimination, this one is necessarily correct. But no problem. We go round two. Round two says, no, I still don't understand. Because round two is emotional response. Emotional response. You're saying, Allah Ta'ala knows if I'm already going to heaven or hell, so what's the point of me doing anything? All right? What's the point of me doing anything? All right. So here I run the box. Remember the box, you take a position. And if you say, okay, if you want to adopt that position, I will flush out all of its logical consequences. You have to accept all of those consequences if you want to accept that position. All right? So a person says, no, but still, if Allah Ta'ala knows if I'm going to heaven or hell, what's the point of me doing anything? Ya fayda. Okay? So logical implication of that is that you can take that stance if you want. But you can't just use it for deen. You have to use it for dunya also. It negates all your actions. You can't say, Kya fayda, what's the benefit, so what's the point of me praying? Because Allah Ta'ala knows anyway. You should say, well, Allah Ta'ala also knows how much risk you're going to get. What's the point of you working? Allah Ta'ala knows how much knowledge you're going to get. What's the point of studying? Allah Ta'ala knows how long you're going to live. What's the point of eating? Well, Allah Ta'ala knows how many breaths you're destined to take. What's the point of breathing? So if you want to take the logical implication of this, that if you insist this is a paradox, if you accept option number four as a paradox, that Allah Ta'ala is knowing and I'm doing the doing, so my doing is irrelevant and has no meaning because Allah Ta'ala already knows what I'm going to do. So the logical necessary consequence is inaction. Then you should adopt inaction. Not just inaction in deen. That's your nafs telling you that. Inaction in the complete inaction. Don't act. You have no agency, no action. Don't do anything. Don't breathe. Don't eat. 
don't drink, don't talk, don't work, don't study, and fine also, don't pray and don't fast and don't do any of those things either. You want to live a life like that? So real time, there are a few doctors, how long can they last if they don't breathe? Huh, right? Your life will be finished. <laughs> Your life will end as a logical consequence of this if you insist on this position that Allah Ta'ala having the knowing and me doing the doing is a paradox. If it is a paradox, the paradox means, yes, that your entire life is meaningless, your actions are meaningless, so then logically you must become a person of inaction and then you will die within a few minutes. I don't, I'm not counseling you to do this. <laughs> right? Do you see what I'm saying? So because the logical consequences unacceptable it means the position is unacceptable round three round three is the timelessness of the divine round three is this is actually a mistake and I'm still on slide number 12 round three is this is actually a mistake when you say this that Allah Ta'ala knows the past present and future these concepts have no meaning for Allah Ta'ala Allah Ta'ala is transcendental the famous English term for the Arabic Allah Ta'ala is beyond, beyond time. Because time is a creation. He created time. Allah Ta'ala is beyond space. Because space is a creation. He created space. So the university kids who love this, the time-space continuum. Yeah. Allah Ta'ala is beyond any of this. <laughs> there's no linear time. And there's no dimensional spatiality to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. So if a person asks, how big is Allah Ta'ala? It's a nonsensical statement. Because big means spatiality. So the way we express this in Arabic, La zaman lahu, la makan lahu. There's a lot in Tawheed. It's not just la sharika la. La sharika lahu, la mithla lahu, la zaman lahu, la makan lahu. Oh, there's a lot. La jihat lahu. There's no direction to Allah Ta'ala. Right? Now yes, there was once a peasant woman who came to the Prophet wasallam, and he asked her that, where is Allah Ta'ala? She pointed up there. Now science would tell you, well, up there depends. <laughs> Where was the earth on its axis of rotation? Was she in northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere? Was she pointing in a different place? <laughs> right? Right? Obviously she wasn't pointing that Allah Ta'ala is there in the direction where my finger is. She meant Allah Ta'ala is above and beyond this worldly perception. Wara al bara He's above and beyond transcendent. <laughs> she was pointing away. Put it that way. She wasn't pointing up. She was pointing away from the time-space world. But some people, again, who take the literal meaning of hadith, they try to, I'm amazed, there are actually people in Karachi who teach courses just on this topic, that Allah Ta'ala has direction, and He has movement, and He's a physical being, and He physically comes down in the last third of the night, and He goes back up in this Fajr. Oh, what word can we know? These are metaphorical statements in Quran. It's not to be taken literally. Right? Allah Ta'ala is sitting on the arsh. Allah Ta'ala is not sitting on an arsh. The arsh is not a chair. The arsh means when Allah Ta'ala... Okay, I explain this to you also. Arsh, so you understand. Another belief about Allah Ta'ala. Huwa al-an kama kan. Allah Ta'ala exists now as He always existed. Allah Ta'ala continues to exist now as He existed before creating anything. Whether it's the arsh, the kursi, the kalam, the law, the time, the space, the universe, the angels, Jannah, Jahannam. Allah Ta'ala exists now exactly in the same way he was always existed even before he created anything arsh is just a representation of Allah Ta'ala's vantage point so when Allah Ta'ala from his vantage he sends hidayah or he issues creation so arsh is just to denote the emanations from Allah Ta'ala so these are called tajalliyat for example in Quran Allah Ta'ala sent a tajalli on Mount Tur. When Sayyidina Musa Sami asked Allah Ta'ala to see you, Allah Ta'ala sent a tajalli on Mount Tur. Alright? Baridat from Allah Ta'ala. Means Allah Ta'ala sends hidayah in a person's heart. Now I'm doing this movement with you, but that actually doesn't have a direction. That the hidayah, is, where is it coming from? There's no spatial direction. Because the hidayah is coming from Allah Ta'ala. Allah Ta'ala is beyond spatiality. But the word used to explain this from Allah Ta'ala, that's called Arsh. To Allah, in English, the closest way you can is vantage point. But still, that still gives you the word point and vantage, still has space and direction in it. There is no space and no direction. La makan lahu, la jihat lahu. 
All right? The Arsh is physical. The Arsh has a particular place in space. Right? But it doesn't mean Allah Ta'ala is not below the Arsh and Allah Ta'ala is above the Arsh. It's not like that. Allah Ta'ala has no speciality. Even strictly speaking, although obviously we teach our children like this, but strictly speaking to say God is everywhere, that's also not correct. Because everywhere means all of space. But Allah Ta'ala transcends space. But that doesn't mean He's nowhere either. So this, your uncle, our uncle can't understand this. You have to accept this. Our uncle cannot understand Allah Ta'ala as He is. So the Arsh is denoting this notion of Allah Ta'ala as He is and is only known to Himself. So to sit and teach and tell you that Arsh is the throne, Allah Ta'ala sitting on it, claims that you know Allah Ta'ala as He is. No, no, no. Arsh is the limit also. It's the limit of your understanding of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Alright? So here, so I was telling you that Allah Ta'ala is timeless. So to say this Allah Ta'ala knows the future, that's a nonsensical statement. I'll give you an example. If I were to write on the board a timeline, right, of the seerah. So let's say I say zero hijri and I do the whole thing. Let's say the whole ummah. What about that? Zero hijri all the way to 1438 or whatever the year is, right? Now you see it at a glance. You would see all of that in one shot at a glance. Allah Ta'ala's ilm and sama and basr perceives and encompasses all space-time creation at a single glance, at less than a glance. Even to say glance is incorrect. <laughs> Do you understand? So there's no question that Allah knows what's going to happen. There's no going to happen and happened and is happening as far as Allah Ta'ala's knowledge is concerned. Now this is the best way I can explain it, but the reality of it is beyond our comprehension. You can't understand. So if you're thinking, I don't really fully understand, but you've understood. <laughs> Yes, Allah Ta'ala, to know Allah Ta'ala as He Himself truly is, is humanly impossible. Yes, to know Allah Ta'ala as He has revealed Himself to be in His attributes, is possible to a limited extent. What does it mean like, I understand Allah Ta'ala said He's Ar-Rahman, I know He's merciful. But that doesn't mean, do I know every single aspect of His merciful nature? No, I don't know that. <laughs> That's beyond my understanding. The entire meaning of Allah Ta'ala being Ar-Rahman. But there's a deep understanding that is there when I know that Allah Ta'ala is Ar-Rahman. That's the Hidayah and that's what Allah Ta'ala wants from me. So that's called Ma'rafa, to know Allah Ta'ala as much as He may be known. And the other part is called Ajz, to be Ajz, to accept, you're an Abd, to accept the human inability to know Allah Ta'ala as He only knows Himself to be. And these two have a meeting point. Imam Al-Ghazali said that Ma'rafa is Ayn Ajz. That you keep getting to know Allah Ta'ala more and more and more as He has revealed Himself to be until you realize He is ultimately unknowable. So to ultimately know Allah Ta'ala is to know that He is ultimately unknowable. Got it? Alright. So by the way, even in this one also, ultimately, this is going to be the same thing for this. To ultimately understand why there is no paradox between free will and predestination is ultimately unknowable. <laughs> you can know and learn to a certain extent and then you'll have to trust that Allah Ta'ala is just and Him sending people to heaven and hell is not unjust. But here are a few rounds, a few more rounds with you. Slide number 13. Another argument people take is that no, whatever a person does is based on their nature. So people try to use this number one to get themselves off the hook for sinning. That, oh, I can't control myself, I have a lustful nature. Oh, I can't stop myself, I have an angry nature. So suggesting that their nature predetermines their actions, and therefore they should not be, not be held morally responsible and accountable for them on the Day of Judgment. So obviously, one is the Islamic answer. It's very clear. <laughs> Allah said that you will not be accountable for anything that was not within your wus'a, not within your capability. Second, all of Qur'an is in human capability. Second point, don't think what you think you're capable of. No, no. What, you, what is the wus'a, what is the cap capacity and capability of insan that Allah has mentioned. So that's what I told you in the beginning. That all of deen is fitra. All of deen has been perfectly designed for the human being. Every human is capable of lowering the gaze. Allah Ta'ala has not given us any command in the Quran that we're not capable of doing. So Allah Ta'ala, it doesn't mean that people use this, I, well, I'm a sleepy person, I'm not capable of praying Fajr. And Allah Ta'ala said, لا يكلف الله نفسا إلا وسعها. This wrong use of this verse. No, you have wusa. Everything, you're not realizing your wusa. 
You under-realize your potential, like people did in the dunya all the time. So many people have under-tapped, under-realized their potential in the world, and just like that, they under-realize, they're under-achievers, low-achievers, under-achievers, when it comes to deen. You have wusa. Allah Ta'ala gave you the wusa. So there's no notion like that. Okay, but at a practical experience level, yes, no doubt, you will find when you compare individuals, that individuals have different natures. For example, you might find a person, and everybody, Allah tells me, everybody a mix of good and bad attributes. So you might find one person who they're very quick to anger. You'll say they're hot-tempered, so that's a bad attribute. But at the same time, they're extremely generous, and they give a lot in charity, and they really care about the poor, genuinely. But at the same time, they're hot-tempered. You may find a second person that they're very cool-tempered. You try to instigate them, even then they don't react. <laughs> There's no flammability. No, the other one is highly flammable. Highly flammable personality. This other one is just like flame proof. You guys have a sadhu buddhu sabandha chherte bhi hai kuch ne Right? In English means you try to instigate them. I'm, but I'm sticking to English because we have a lot of online listeners from different English speaking countries in the world. Alright? Just to clarify for those of you who are here. And for the online people, because I have a lot of Urdu speaking people in front of me, so every now and then they draw a line or two from me. Alright? Hmm. So you have the second person, he's not prone to anger at all. But at the same time, he's extremely stingy. Yes, extremely stingy. You can find that, right? Now, fine. So let's start with this. So we will say, what is the difference? Let's say you say it's their nature. But the point is that Islam, Deen, has the power to change the nature of a human being. This is coming tomorrow. This is called Tazkiyah. So yes, فَأَلَهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا But next, كَنْ أَفْلَهَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا So Allah Ta'ala has put some good and bad in all of us. But then Allah Ta'ala sent Deen to do Tazkiyah to purify the bad. So if you submit, if a person learned the teachings of Deen called Tazkiyah, that very angry person can also get rid of their anger. And that very stingy person can learn to become generous. So there's no notion of nature as a limiting factor on a person's freedom of action. To whatever extent it's limiting now, the teachings of Tazkiyah of Deen will remove those limits. Sometimes people scientifically, they try to make the claim that, for example in genetics, the latest research, but they don't claim it's a theory, it's just their research. They're trying to find out if this is the case. So you can all hypothesis. It's called behavioral genes, right? That are some genes responsible for certain types of behavior. And you can imagine, right, if somebody made that claim, it's going to be a big problem. So let's take an example of a person who's extremely angry, right? And because of that anger, he does violent acts. So if I meet somebody who's a victim of their violence, and I tell them, well, there's nothing we can do because that person is genetically programmed to be angry. Right? Let's say it's his wife or her husband or her child or his child. So they would say, no, no, no. What do you mean genetically programmed to be angry? Please help him. Put him in anger management therapy. Give him counseling. Help get this anger out of him. I say, no, nature. He's genetically doomed to be angry. Now, experience shows this is also incorrect. All of psychology, all of counseling, all of therapy and the... Outside the Islamic realm, and all of tazkiyah, islah, purification of the heart, reform of the person, character reformation shows that no, this person is not gen genetically predetermined to only be angry. We can work with them. We can do therapy, counseling. Give him just for a few months, we'll send him back to you a soft, gentle, loving husband. I, I wish it was that easy. <laughs> all the women are saying, I need his number. <laughs> and they're signing up their husbands for two, three month course. I wish it was that easy. <laughs> Huh? Akbar. But it is, it is possible. It's not easy. Don't think Tazkiya and Islam is not easy. Changing yourself is not easy. The deen has put that ability that is part of the hidayah of Allah subhanahu wa Second is people say nurture. Nurture. So that I am who I am. Uh, I will do the birth thing later. That's coming later. So just stick to 13. Nurture just means that because of the way my parents raised me. Right? I'm not going to do the born in Muslim family that's coming in two sides for now. That's coming. Just in terms of because this was my, this was I was raised or this was my parents or these were my friends or this is the school I went to. No. 
Because you will find two brothers who, if you're thinking about statistics, right? Now, yes, fine, they're two years apart, but in terms of statistics, they're born in the same era, right? They're born in the same city. They're born in the same household. They're born to the same parents. Let's say they both went to the same school. They even had the same school teachers, but they turn out radically different, right? So that means nurture is not necessarily determining. Yes, it might set limits, right? So also let's be clear, Islam doesn't make the claim that every human being has an unlimited range of freedom. No. They have enough freedom for that freedom to be responsible and therefore be accountable. I'll give you an example from computer science. So there's an area in computer science called artificial intelligence. So for example, Deep Blue. Who has ever heard of Deep Blue? Yeah, okay, other than our lums kids. Deep Blue was a supercomputer made by IBM to play chess against then grandmaster Gary Kasparov. All right, so what was the notion? Artificial intelligence means we were going to try to program the computer to think on its own. So it has a certain range of choices. All right, and basically, I can't remember the exact score, but they traded some games. One of them did win the majority, but it wasn't a shutout. So if they played seven games, it wasn't 7-0, it was 4-3 or 5-2, I don't remember what it was. But the point was, they, they, they said that they are successful, that they have invented a machine of artificial intelligence. Why? Because they, the claim was that Deep Blue made choices. Deep Blue chose how, what move to make in response to Kasparov, right? Now, computer science will also tell you that no computer has infinite parameters. No way, it's not infinite. They were finite parameters. They were finite, but they were enough to suggest that choice and freedom is there. So we're the same way. Islam doesn't claim you're infinite, you have infinite powers, infinite abilities. You're not super, super, superheroes or super villains or whatever they call super creatures. It's finite. The parameters are finite. And one of the limitations, yes, you were born today, you weren't born 500 years ago. The person who was born five years ago didn't have the same choices you have today. So yes, there are some parameters. But it being finite, that also does not negate the concept of free will. All right? So this is the notion of nature and nurture. Next round. I'm going to keep doing this for rounds with you. Right? But the last round is that this is the only extent we can understand it. And ultimately, if that's not sufficient to you, then you will just have to accept that it's not a paradox. Slide 14. Another interesting thing, the way the Deen of Islam frames this question is actually Islamic theology, the crux of Islamic theology is free will. All of Islamic theology is dependent on free will. All of Islamic theology requires free will. Because without free will, there's no concept of moral accountability, responsibility, reward, punishment, judgment by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Without free will, there's no question of doing tazkiyah and islah to make yourself choose better choices and do better actions. There's no question of asking Allah ta'ala for hidayah to make better choices and better actions if you have no free will as to what you choose and what you do. Now understand this, the very purpose, the very purpose of Allah Ta'ala creating humanity and the jinn, but we leave the jinn aside for now. Leave the jinn aside, that's another topic which I've never yet taught in my life. Because I actually feel that the hidayah, and this is also answering your questions, how much knowledge do we need to know about certain things? It's a very good question. There's no one answer, it depends what thing it is. So for example, as far as I'm concerned about jinn, all you need to know about jinn is to believe in their existence and whatever Allah Ta'ala said about them in the Quran. That's it. You don't have to start asking me this question that do jinn have free will the same way we do? It's not part of your hidayah. It's not part of our hidayah. Alright? But humanity and jinn do have free will. So anyway, casting aside the jinn for a moment, in some, is that unique creation. What does it mean when Allah Ta'ala created humanity? He wanted to create a unique creation of His that was endowed and gifted with an ability that no other creation has and that is the freedom to disbelieve and the freedom to disobey. The sun cannot disbelieve in Allah Ta'ala. A cat cannot disbelieve in Allah Ta'ala. The grass cannot disobey Allah Subhanahu Ta'ala. There is no creation in all of Allah Ta'ala's creation that has been given this freedom. An angel cannot disbelieve in Allah Ta'ala. An angel cannot disobey Allah Ta'ala. They can question. They don't dis disobey. They, take, they are questioning. They're, 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 they're in Quran and the Hadith also. They question Allah Ta'ala. But they don't disobey. Alright? And they question not out of skepticism. They question out of learning. They want to learn. Right? 
They want to tell us to explain to them why are you putting this Adam alayhi salam on earth who's going to create facade for the earth. They weren't saying Allah told them don't do it. That's not that sometimes the English translation makes it sound to you like that. That they're requesting as in don't do it. They're requesting to learn. Well, why would you want? We want to learn about you. We're learning something new about you. We thought you were that being who's just content with us. But you have now revealed yourself to be a being. We're seeing a new aspect of your mercy. Right? You see, the angels, they never get the maghfir of Allah Ta'ala because they never sin. So probably, as one example I will give you, but this is called speculative theology, that the angels on that day learned that Allah Ta'ala is also a ghafar al ghafur They had never seen that aspect of Allah Ta'ala before because there was no, nothing to forgive. <laughs> There's nothing in creation that gets that forgiveness. Right? So they didn't know. <laughs> so that's why they asked, why would you create a being who's going to create fasad? Because my sifat of maghfirah needs to have a manifestation now. Alright? Khair. So the purpose of humanity is to create a creation that uniquely has the ability to freely obey or freely disobey, freely believe, or the freedom to disbelieve and the freedom to disobey. That's why human beings were created. Alright? To give them that freedom. Alright. Next round is that don't worry, slide 15 is coming. Then am I really free to believe if I'm born in the Hindu family and am I really free to... It's coming in slide 15. Your all-time favorite, it's coming. Alright? Another question though, is that okay, let's say I accept that I freely believe or disbelieve, freely obey, disobey. Why is the punishment forever? So if there was somebody who disbelieves in Allah Ta'ala and disobeys Allah Ta'ala for 80 years of their life, so put them in Jahannam for 80 years. Why put them in Jahannam for eternity? It's a very intense concept. Believe me, if I build that workshop for you, you would be sweating, and you would be shivering, and you would probably run for your lives if I showed you the workshop and all the verses in Quran about Jahannam, Azab, Iqab, Zu Intikam, Allah Ta'ala's vengeance, wrath, anger, punishment, torment, fire, hell. If I build that workshop for you, hmm? Allah, what can be done? Forget you, me, I wouldn't have the strength to teach you that workshop. I would never, I wouldn't be able to go more than a few slides on that. That's also a workshop though. Those of you who have been coming all four days know what I mean by the workshop. Workshop means if I was to gather all the verses in Quran, and then all the hadith of Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that talk about the fire, jahannam, punishment, wrath, anger, vengeance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it would be an overwhelming experience. Hmm? All right? So then the person has this question. And all of that for eternity? Hmm? So this is due to intentions. The answer to eternity, last line of slide 14, intentions and actions. So I will explain to you by giving you an example. So pretend there are two Babaji's. Babaji, for those who know them, means two old men. They're both 80 years old. Okay. Now one of them is a very pious, wali, muttaqi, salih believer. So one of our young university friends goes to Babaji and says, so I'll do a little bit in Urdu, then I'll translate for the other listeners. Ki Babaji, aap kab tak Allah Ta'ala ki ibadat karte rengge? Aap to bhure ho ge, hadiyo ke danche ban ge, aap ek raat mere saath kuch ayashi kar lein. Huh? Huh? Allah Akbar. Toh Babaji kya ki nahi? Mene Ta'ala ki ibadat karna hai. Oh Babaji, toh asti saal ho gaya hai. سو سال عمر ہوگی اس وقت تک بھی اللہ ہی کے ماننا ہے سو سال عمر تک میں مانوں گا بس کرنا ہے ہزار سال عمر دیں ہم مانوں گا you keep going اسے بس میں نے ہمیشہ ہی ماننا ہے میں نے اپنے رب کو ہمیشہ ہی ماننا ہے منوانا ہے میں ہمیشہ کس ہوتا ہے the other بابا جی 80 year old Marxist atheist drinking سمجھ گئے so the university sin goes to him oh بابا جی کچھ خدا کو خوف کرو اسی سال ہوگے کچھ توبہ کر لو کچھ اللہ لو سیکھ لو مرنے سے پہلے کہتا ہے نہیں I've met people like this I have met people 80 plus like this نہیں میں نے کوئی نماز نہیں پڑھنا شراب روز پینا ہے اللہ اکبر کبیرہ بابا جی اگر اللہ تعالیٰ آپ کو سو سال دیں گے آپ پھر بھی یہ کرتے رہیں گے پھر بھی کرتے رہوں گا پھر بھی نہیں مانوں گا لیکن بابا جی اللہ تعالیٰ آپ کو ہزار سال دے میں مانتے نہیں ہو بیٹے میں آپ کو کیا کہنا میں نہیں مانتا 
میں نے یہی زندگی گزارنا ہے میری یہ ہمیشہ کی زندگی ہے اس کی بنیت ہمیشہ کی ہے ان نما امان و بنیات اس کو ہمیشہ ہی کے امال کا سزا یا جزا میں لگا کہ ہم کے دن ہمیشہ کی نیت تھی And you understand? Now explain to the English audience. So the two old men, one is an 80-year pious, true, sincere, honest, upright believer. And imagine if a sly young man comes to him and says, that oh, old man, you spent 80 years of your life obeying and worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Come party with me tonight. Hmm? So the old man would say, no, I'm not going to come with you tonight. He says, oh, old man, you're going to keep, how long are you going to live this life of piety and asceticism and worship? So oh, I'm gonna, this is my life. So what if you live to 100? This is what I would do. What if you live to 200? This is what I would do. What if you live to 1,000? Eventually you'll say, look, I'm gonna be like this forever. <laughs> forever. So because his niya is forever. Just like that you can imagine, and there are people like that, and I've personally encountered them, literally 80 plus. And they don't pray, and they don't fast, and they drink on a daily basis. So imagine if somebody goes to them and says, old man, How long are you going to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? How long will you be distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Can't you reflect that death is near, you're soon to enter your grave? Would you not like to make toba and also fall in love with Allah ta'ala? He said, no. <laughs> no. This is who I am and this is what I do. I have no intention whatsoever of ever praying or stopping my daily drink. He said, oh man, oh uncle, what if you live to a hundred? This is what I'm going to do. What if you were to live to a thousand? This is what I would do. You keep asking, he will tell you. Look, son, leave me alone. This is how I'm going to be forever. So his niya is forever. Now what Allah Ta'ala does, he pulls the plug. He doesn't let the person live forever. He pulls the plug and on the day of judgment, he will give them the reward or the punishment based on their intention of how they would have led their life were they had to live forever. This is why people make a lot of dua of what's called khatam bil khair. That in the state that you die, what was the intention? What was your life and lifestyle at that time? That's why we tell people it's never too late. You're 50, 60, 70, retired. You can still change. You live the last 10 days of your life like a true wali of Allah Ta'ala and your intention is I would be like this forever. You will get that reward forever. But it doesn't mean you calculate and leave it for the last 10 days of your WHO life expectancy because not everybody reaches that life expectancy. No one knows what the last 10 days of their life are. It's quite possible from all the people listening and attending this course, not every one of you or me may be here exactly one year from today. No one knows. <laughs> so because you don't know, And you know what was my true heartfelt intention, how I would live my life on the last day of my life. And today and every day could be that last day of my life. I will live every day of my life with that pure intention that Allah Ta'ala, I'm yours forever. I'm your Abd forever. I'm your Fakir forever. I'm your Abd, Abid forever. I will obey you forever. I will follow the Sunnah of Nabi Akrim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam forever. I will have Haya forever. I will do Zikr forever. I will have good behavior forever. Good Akhlaq forever. Be loyal husband forever. Be an obedient wife forever. I want to do it forever. That's called Mu'min. That's called Imam. All right? Okay. Side number 15. Round, whatever. Next round. Muslim or non-Muslim, is this by birth or by choice? All right. First, answer on this. Is historically Islam, like any other religion, any movement, is, begins with converts. All Sahaba, Muslim by choice. All Tabi'in, pretty much Muslim by choice. Some of you might say, okay, they were children of Sahaba. Okay, let's leave that for the moment. But you're talking about the early numbers, the massive numbers of Tabi'in are also converts, not children of Sahaba. The overwhelming majority of the second generation Tabi'in were also converts. Same for Tabi'in. Tabi it keeps going on. Right? Okay. So I think that's not an issue. That's not an issue for a convert. Nobody's going to ask this question, were they by birth, by choice? Well, no, by birth they weren't. So if you say these are the two options, they weren't by birth, they were by choice. So I don't have to answer this question for the converts. All right? Okay. What about the others who are born Muslim? All right. So does that mean I freely believed Answer number one. Yes, because when you became an adult, surely as a child you didn't have that freedom of choice, accept it. 
when you became an adult. In any case, Allah Ta'ala doesn't reward or punish you for what you do in childhood anyway. So understand the theology as well. Reward and punishment is only for what a person does in adulthood. It means that a child might be very naughty. <laughs> but there's no sin. <laughs> he won't get sin or punishment for that naughtiness as a child. Alright? Okay. So reward and punishment is based on adulthood. An adult makes a choice. Now, it's a very sad thing I will say to you, but the proof for this is, again, I know young Muslim men and women, 18, 19, 20, 20, and 22, who have chosen to disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They've chosen atheism. So how did they make that choice? If supposedly they're not free to choose, they're not free to choose to believe in Allah ta'ala because they were born Muslim. I'll give you proof. I mean, it's very sad. I don't like to talk about that. It's the, one of the saddest aspects of the contemporary state of the ummah today. But it's not one, two of them. There's a, there's a number and there's a growing number of them. But that's proof that despite the fact they were born in a Muslim family, when they were adult, they, they have the freedom to disbelieve in Allah Ta'ala. All I told you in theology is freedom to disbelieve. Not unlimited parameters. They're finite parameters. But they have that freedom. And the fact that that freedom exists, the proof is in the pudding, as they say. The fact that the freedom exists is that people do exercise that freedom. And all of their friends who are worried about them, they are equally free though to make that choice. And sometimes one of those atheists does get one of his friends to make that choice. All the other kids in that same university all have that same level of freedom that that one did, right? There's nothing unique to him that they, all the rest are in chains and being forced to believe in Islam and he's the one who was out of the jail. They're all in the exact same level of freedom. So even if a person is born in a Muslim family, he still has complete freedom to disbelieve in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Alright, let's look at the other way. That's okay, fine, I accept that, but what about the other way? So the argument's often given, so I just gave an example of Raj, I'm just make, picking a name. So say Raj was born in a Hindu family. And most people will just accept what their parents told them. Right, you're absolutely correct. Raj's probability of being a Muslim is less than the probability of a person being a Muslim who was born in a Muslim family. All Islamic theology requires for choice to be there is the probability is zero. It's not zero. Because again, you have a fact that every year there are Hindus who convert to Islam, Sikhs who convert to Islam, Buddhists who convert to Islam, atheists who convert to Islam. All right? Every year. And again, I've met all of the above. Well, let's say a Hindu, definitely. Sikh, yes. Buddhist, I have not yet met personally, but I know they exist. All right? Christian Jews, I've met. Marxist atheists, I've met. All right? So again, the fact of its occurrence, um, let's go back to science, <laughs> empirical evidence. Hmm? The fact that it occurs means it's possible. That's it. All Islamic theology requires is this possibility. And again, the factors are the same. That, let's say that atheist who converted in Denmark, all the other Danish citizens have the same freedom that that person did. They could also have made that choice. You cannot say, no, it's inconceivable that any one of them could make the choice. They don't have freedom. Only this one had freedom. No way. <laughs> if he had the freedom to believe, all of the other ones also had the freedom. They had the equal freedom. And that freedom is sufficient for the person to choose to believe because it's proof he did it. All right. Next round. Still a person insists, okay, fine, fine, I accept there's freedom. But isn't it still unfair? I said, what do you mean by unfair? Because there's less of a chance and I had a greater chance. All right. That is this next line in slide number 15 called transitive good. This is transitive good, yes. The good that your forefathers did does provide you with good. This is in fancy philosophical transitive. It flows from one generation to another. And that their forefathers didn't, that also flows to one generation to another. For example, 99.9% .9 of people currently who are Muslim in India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, and that's 550 million Muslims, 99.9% .9 are descended from Hindu. Somewhere in their forefathers or foremothers, some Hindu accepted Islam. And you are getting the barakah of that because Iman now has come in your lineage. And the other person, the person who's still Hindu in South Asia, so the other pretty much half or slightly, uh, you would say it's about half because if you add Pakistan, Pakistan, India, roughly, I don't know what it is, but let's 60%. Or 55%, the other 55% of the subcontinent, which is still Hindu, yes, they didn't have a forefather or foremother who accepted Islam. So they didn't get in the lineage. Now, let's put this in the box. If you say, well, no, this is, this is why I don't accept it. I can't accept Islam 
because it came to me in my lineage. Okay, put that in the box. Flush out its logical implication. You can't do that just for deen. Because there's another transit of good that reached you, which is your dunya. And especially you were sitting in front of me, you were born with a silver spoon in your mouth. So you should ask this question, that, well, why am I studying, or why do I live in a nice house? I could have been born the son of a rickshaw driver. Yeah, you could have. <laughs> so if that means that you, you shouldn't give up everything, fine, go drive a rickshaw. I'll, I'll, I'll buy it for you if you want to do it. None of you do that when it comes to dunya. You could have also been uneducated. Of course you could have been if you were born in a family that couldn't afford education. So what you're saying is what? I'm perfectly fine accepting the transitive good that came to me in terms of dunya without any questions whatsoever. And I'm not fine accepting the transitive good that came to me in terms of iman and deen. So what you should say is what? I will accept the transitive good that came to me in dunya, but I will spend my life trying to share and spread that good with others. Means that those who are uneducated can become educated. Those who are poor are no longer poor. Right? And also in deen, I will accept the transitive good that came to deen to me in terms of iman, and I will spend my life trying to share and spread that iman in dawah, so those who didn't get that iman will also get that iman. This is what you're supposed to say. How foolish is that young or not young man or woman, university student or graduate, who stops praying and stops believing in Allah for this reason, that, well, I was born in a Muslim family and Raj was born in a Hindu family. What you're supposed to do is go out there and meet Raj and share with him what you got through your family. That's what you were supposed to do. All right. Next point is guidance and misguidance. Oh, boy. Guidance and misguidance. Guidance and misguidance. This is the very first paper I've wrote in my life on Quran. And the first workshop I built, because this is a small workshop, that where Allah Ta'ala talks about misguidance also in Quran. Yudhillu man yasha. He misguides whomsoever he wants. So that's another question. Do I really have freedom to disbelieve? If I'm one, do I really have freedom to believe I'm one of those people Allah Ta'ala misguides? Hmm? So when I built that workshop, all the verses in which Allah Ta'ala says this, that He misguides, I found something. And you can build it now. You, I've already trained you how to build the workshop. You may not be trained how to understand the workshop, but at least you know what a workshop is and you could build it. So I found in that, that in every single verse when Allah Ta'ala says this, that He misguides people, first they had chosen that course themselves. So what happens if a person chooses to disbelieve in Allah Ta'ala? Allah Ta'ala keeps guiding them. First is the inherent guidance which is in their fitrah. They don't answer that. They keep getting doses of hidayah, keep getting, they re, there's a point. Like Allah says, He sets a seal on their heart. There's a point that they willfully choose to deny and ignore successive guidance. Then at some point Allah Ta'ala says, fine, if you're so insistent, it's your choice. If you are so insistent on choosing misguidance, fine, I accept you for that path. Like we also want. That we keep choosing the path of guidance, Allah Ta'ala makes us makbul. Allah Ta'ala makes us makbul on this path. They can also become makbul on that path. So when Allah Ta'ala makes them makbul on that path, that's called misguidance. It doesn't mean they were standing at the fork and Allah Ta'ala misguided them. That's not what it means. They were at the fork, they chose the wrong way. Allah Ta'ala put another fork in front of them, another chance. They kept choosing the wrong path over and over and over again. They already set themselves on the path of misguidance. The best example of this is Abu Lahab. Because it actually also, this is said that Allah sealed his heart. Why did Allah seal his heart? At the outset? No way. It can't, I read once, but Allah, because I couldn't source it, I can't remember if it's about Abu Jahl and Abu Lahab are both examples of this. They say that Rasulullah went to them over hundreds, hundreds of times in Dawah. And they saw the beauty of Sayyidina Rasulullah, he saw them and they rejected it. And not just once. How many times did they gaze upon the beauty, the physical and character beauty of Sayyidina Rasulullah how many times did they reject it? How many times did they hear Qur'an and how many times did they reject it? So they got so many hidayah, so many forks of the road, they kept choosing wrong, kept choosing wrong, kept choosing wrong, so there comes a point that Allah Ta'ala says, He seals their heart. It wasn't at the outset, so that didn't determine, that was the outcome. That didn't determine, that was the final outcome. 
Same thing for a person. On the other side, a person keeps obeying Allah Ta'ala, keeps obeying Allah Ta'ala, keeps obeying Allah Ta'ala. What happens? Allah Ta'ala also sets a seal on them. What? Ya ayyutahan nafsul mutma inna irji. Irji ila rabbiki radiya bumardiya. Finished. Makbul. Makbul. It happens on both sides. A person doesn't get that at the start. That also doesn't happen at the start. That person was starting in the fork of two roads and they got that. No. That keeps coming and they kept getting wrong turns. They didn't take it. Shaitan kept putting exits. They didn't take it. Nafs kept putting exits. They didn't take it. They kept staying on the right path. Kept staying, kept staying, kept staying, kept staying. Yirji ila rabbi ki radiyatam mardiya. Allah akbar kabira. There's symmetry. There's a pure symmetry in the theology of Quran and the theology of our deen. All right. The last thing was salvific theology, but we're going to have to mm, leave that out. Uh, but very, I'll give you the very briefest explanation of that. That's the question that is every non-believer doomed to hell. It's a very complicated thing, so I can't open it for you. I'm just going to show you the label. Not even, not even behind the scenes tour. Nothing. We're going to show you the gate of the factory. <laughs> All right, and that is that those non-believers who knew Islam in its true representation and chose not to accept it, yes, they will definitely go to hell forever. Such as Abu Lahab, Abu Jahal, and there's so many others also. Don't it is not just historically; it's still today as well. All right. Question people rose is what about non-believers who never knew about Islam? So Imam Ghazali in that work I told you to read, which is available in your Karachi, Faisal Tafrika, he actually mentions actually one of the best examples of this, that even in the lifetime of Sayyidina Rasulullah Wasallam, all the people living in Europe hadn't really heard. I mean, they may have gotten some wind from some trader, but they didn't really know what Islam was. The Quran had not really fully reached them. The true message, complete message of the Prophet had not reached them. So they were in the time, because the question is, okay, before the time was different, right? But in his time, and even immediately after his time, and even there may be, so people like to ask, what about the Aborigines in Australia, or the Bushmen in the Kalahari Desert, right? Now, Allah, Allah, I don't know to whom Islam has reached or not reached. I don't know if only CNN Islam has reached them, or real, true Islam has reached them. I know two things. Number one, if Islam has not yet reached them all the way in 2016, we are the only ones to blame for that. The Ummah is the only one to blame for that. If only CNN Islam or Fox News Islam has reached them, again, the Ummah is the only one to blame for that. You can't blame Fox News or Islamophobia, right? There wouldn't be any, you see, you wouldn't be scared of the venomous snake if you knew that there's one million species of snakes that have no poison. But if the other snakes are all on the ground, and the only ones that are hanging out on top are the venomous ones, so you can't blame people for thinking all snakes are poisonous. Right? There's only Ummah to blame. If, so Allah, Allah knows best who, to whom Islam has reached or not. There's nothing, that's not, you don't have to make that decision, by the way. You don't have to apply the decision. You just have to have the belief in theory that any non-believer who knew or knows Islam and chooses not to believe in it, they will go to hell forever. All right? We don't have to know which non-believers are the ones who know and don't know. That's not our job. That's Allah does right on the Day of Judgment. The question is that if I, the last thing is, theoretically, if I allow for this concept, so theoretically means theologically, what does Islam say? Now, again, we don't know who these are either, but that non-believer who does not know Islam, Right? So like Imam Zali took the very first such example that the Europeans who died in the lifetime of Sayyidina Rasulullah so some are even just a few years after he passed away. So it's clear that for them it's clear. We can say this. They were in this category. They don't, they're, they don't, they're not believers. But they don't know Islam. So for that the theologians have taken lots of different positions. Right? One position is that they will be judged on the inherent morality of the fitra. For example, such a Viking so, yeah, this is what they were, you know, you think Europeans, you're thinking, I'm talking about that time, we're talking about Vikings and barbarians, right? So that barbarian Viking, and we also, the Arabs were before the Muslim barbarians, Jahiliya, right? So they were still in their Jahiliya. So that barbarian Viking will be judged on his inherent morality. It means he also knew I shouldn't kill. He also knew I shouldn't rape my neighbor's wife. 
He also knew these things. He doesn't need Quran to tell him that. He didn't need the Sunnah of the Prophet to tell him that. So he'll be judged on that. That's one position, right? There are a whole host of positions on that. Uh, but that's enough to show you, uh, because like I told you, I personally feel you don't need to know any more beyond this. Because what's going to happen to a non-believer after they die is between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What happens to a non-believer in this life is between our ummah and them. Do we give them the dawah or not? That's all you have to worry about. So it's, it's foolish to worry about what's going to happen to them after they die. Right? And if you really are worried about that, that's, that means if you truly, if you have the true concern about that, you should be making dawah. There's only one thing you need to know about non-believers is it's the job of the ummah to make dawah to them. Yes, if a person is making dawah, then you can come and ask me something else. And if you're not yet making dawah, I'm not even interested in satisfying your curiosity about what will really happen to them after they die. Why should I do that? If you're really curious, wait till the Day of Judgment. Hmm? First, I don't know the answer. Only Allah, Allah knows that. To what extent the scholars have written about that, you don't need to know that. I personally, yeah, I have no qualms telling you. I don't view this as hiding knowledge. <laughs> I can't hide it from you. you. You could try to learn it if you want. But I'm not going to teach you things that I don't think are of benefit to you. All right? Your only concern for the non-believer is how you can introduce Allah Ta'ala to them, how you can introduce Sayyidina Rasulullah to them. Your only concern with the non-believer who refuses your introduction is to pray that Allah Ta'ala sends somebody in their life who can better introduce it than you did. That's it. You have no concern with what's going to happen with them on the Day of Judgment. Alright? I have to...